Hey guys, thanks for joining us for this 140th episode in Season 2 of Good Questions with Cameron Dole. Special guests on this episode include, from Season 21 of The Voice, we've got Jamani, Holly Forbes, and Haley Mia, all from Team Kelly. From Team Legend, we'll be visiting with Sabrina Diaz. And from Team Blake, we'll visit with Carson Peters. We'll also visit with actress Darby Stanchfield as Season 2 of Lock and Key is now streaming on Netflix. Of course, if you would, please take the time to subscribe, comment, leave some feedback, check out the shop, and share with your friends. Now, it's kind of amazing that airline passengers are still finding new ways to annoy each other, and here is the latest. Someone posted a photo after a woman with long hair draped it over the back of her headrest, so it was hanging down right in front of their face. Their tray table is closed in the photo, but if they'd been eating, her hair would have been in their food. Now, a few people with long hair weighed in online and said they understand why she'd want to get all that hair out of her way. But obviously, putting it in someone else's way isn't a good fix. Now, one person joked they would have gently opened their tray table and closed it back up with her hair inside. Season 21 of The Voice continues on NBC. The Battle Rounds, uh, Jiminy with us today. And Jiminy, I know we'll talk about the Battle Rounds, the uh, the blind audition and all that. First off, it's, it's a privilege to have the chance to visit with you today. Thank you so much. It's an honor to be on your show. Now, Jiminy, talk about coming into the show, the, the the voice. Obviously, music has been so instrumental, a part of your life. Life does happen, but uh, this is an opportunity. You're, you're giving a lot of folks hope with uh, with your story of resilience. And tell us what it's like to get some feedback from uh, from the viewers, if you will. Well, I just want to say I'm so happy that I'm giving people hope with my story because that's all I wanted to do. I wanted people to recognize that even if you go through something, still go after your dream. So it's amazing that, you know, I get the DMs and the messages of how people feel and and that's just the the best feeling ever. Now, who was it that spurred you on to to try out for the blind auditions in the first place and and what was that experience like for you personally? Well, Cameron, if I have to be honest, I originally auditioned for season 19 of The Voice and I um, got pregnant with my second daughter. And so I put it and put it on hold and I got the opportunity again. They reached out to me and I was like, wow, like I really have this opportunity. And so I had my family's support behind me to watch my daughters. And I said, you know what? I'm going for it. After getting the the chair turns, what was that like uh, singing to the back of chairs? For I, I'm sure that's not something you're accustomed to, right? Not at all. I'm, I'm used to faces and smiles and cameras and all all all, all of it. <laughs> <laughs> now, what, is, Jiminy? What has been the biggest uh, the biggest tidbit that you've received so far from from Coach Kelly? And and what's it like working with her on a hand on a on a first person basis? Kelly is an amazing coach. She has a good ear. So I think her ear makes her, in my opinion, better than the other coaches because she's able to listen to a person and almost on the spot tell you exactly what you should do to make the song better. And so one thing that she told me was make sure when you're going into your lower register, you don't go so low to the point where it disappears like in the studio it'll be amazing but with live shows going that low it you, it might disappear and you lose the essence of what you're trying to do i mean kelly is amazing and she's got a, a little experience too and, and and how has that helped you going in through this season knowing that she's been in that reality competition as well because she understands the politics of it all she understands the behind the scenes she understands that yeah, we're up there singing on stage, but there's so much other things that go into, you know, putting this stuff on. And she just, she takes you by the hand and just guides you through it. And I love it. <laughs> now, the battle with, with Aaron and, and like I've mentioned with so many of the, the other contestants as well, the battle seemed more of a duo and a duet than, than a battle. And what was, what was the mindset coming in there with, uh, with battling against uh, Aaron, a teammate that you, you obviously have, uh, have a fondness for as well? Me and Aaron, um, first I want to say amazing artist, amazing writer, songwriter, amazing singer. I, well, we, we wanted to make sure that 
we did the song justice. So yeah, we were, you know, we're in a competition, we're battling, but we want to sound good together. And so, yes, we were battling for a specific spot, but if it was up to me, I would have definitely, you know, pulled both of us through because the amount of creativity we we put together, it, it was amazing. The, I, I always say we were the best battle pair to me, <laughs> but um, I absolutely love, I absolutely love singing with Aaron. He made it so easy just as far as arranging and getting everything together. Like he was the best partner. And I'm, I, I cannot say that so many times. And Jiminy, how hard is it every time you get up to, to perform knowing that you've got the Ariana, you've got John, you've got Blake, you've got Kelly and, and they're not necessarily picking you apart, but they're cheering you on. I mean, how cool is that? It's amazing. It's it's like a dream come true. When you think of, you know, where these people are and what they've been through and the accolades they accomplished, it's like you're singing in front of them and you're getting the advice and mentorship that people would kill for. People would buy and sell their souls for. So you just you just become grateful for the opportunity and say, you know what, either I can sound bad and embarrass myself in front of them or I can just shake it off and do my best. That's right. Now, Jiminy, if folks want to keep up with everything you've got going social media wise, and obviously as the, the voting comes live again, where's the best place for, for listeners to keep up with you as social media wise? Yes. So you can follow me on IG at I am Jiminy underscore. I also have a Facebook page called Jiminy and my TikTok is Jim at Jiminy 21 and Twitter. I am Jiminy. <laughs> <laughs> you got all the bases covered, Jiminy. Yeah, I am Jiminy. <laughs> <laughs> That's awesome. Well, congratulations uh, thus far in the season. Looking forward to more continued success for you. And hopefully we can catch up again real soon. Thank you so much, Cameron. I definitely uh, hope so as well. Are you a sweater? You know, like someone who sweats too much. Not the warm wool thing. You're definitely not the only one. Well, and you don't have to keep on suffering in your personal moistness factor either. Here are four things that you can do if you sweat way more than you would like. Number one, change what you eat. Now, you already probably know that spicy food can make you sweat, but things like processed sugar, caffeine, and alcohol can also raise your body temperature and make you sweat, especially at night. Number two, drink more water. Yes, the way to stop being so wet is to increase your internal wetness. Well, if you drink more water, it will help regulate your body temperature, and that stops you from sweating. Number three, buy products designed for the sweating. Now, there's a whole market of products out there for people who need help with excessive sweating. Special deodorants for all over your body, wipes, and even electric anti-sweat machines that you can use at home. Number four, wear more breathable clothing. Wear clothes made of cotton, linen, and silk, and avoid things like polyester, denim, and fleece. And one more note, if you're really sweating a lot, these tricks don't work, you might have a condition called hyperhidrosis. So you should really ask your doctor, there is a chance the sweating could be a sign of something more serious. The Voice is uh, where we're spending some time today and uh, just got done with the battle rounds uh, performing Cardigan by Taylor Swift. We got Sabrina Diaz from Team Legend with us. And first off, Sabrina, appreciate you taking some time. Of course. What's up, everybody? Thank you so much, Cameron, for having me. And I'm so excited for this. Now, tell us what uh, what this year has been like so far. The uh, the blind auditions. I mean, that's got to be crazier than anything you've probably ever done to begin with before even before even delving into the battle rounds. What tell us uh, the blind audition. Tell us what was that? What was that like for you? The blind audition was the most nerve wracking experience ever, um, but one of the best experiences of my life. Um, before I went on, um, we decided that I would sing Girl from Ipanema in Portuguese, Garota de Ipanema. Um, and I was like, you know what? I'm going to do it. I'm going to represent Brazil. Um, as no one has ever sang in Portuguese on the show. So I was really excited to do that. And that's just a classic song that I think even all Americans would know it by the melody. Um, so I said, I'm going to take the risk. Um, and I, right before I went on stage, I was waiting for those doors to open and my legs started shaking and I was like, <laughs> you better get up there and sing. Um, and I did it and I sang and 
freaking John Legend turned his chair, which was so exciting. And this was just the best, the best experience I've had, the best vocal coaches. Um, and I am so excited for whatever's coming next. Now mm-hmm. we, we talked the, the battle rounds and this, it, it seems like everyone that I've talked to their their battle has been more of a duo and you can see the friendship there as well. And so, so it is competition, but uh, how hard is it to go against uh, your teammates and your compadres, if you will? Um, that is actually the worst part because we end up being really good friends. Um, we end up hanging out all the time um, at the hotel. We're constantly together. So it's not like we only see each other at rehearsal. It's like, hey, you want to have breakfast? Let's go have breakfast. You know what I mean? <laughs> so, um, and my battle partner, we were super cool. And we were like, really, we are really good friends. So it was very difficult to go against him. Um, and I, we were both like, I really hope one wins, one gets a steal or a save. That was just like... Um, what we wanted so that sucked Um, but we both had an amazing experience I had the opportunity to work with one of the best voices I've ever heard he has a beautiful voice Um, and just be this is just I guess part of the ride my my, my question on that performance is did you guys have to draw straws to who was going to sing the last line of that one because you really milked that one I'm just saying (laughs) <laughs> no, no, I, I was I was supposed to sing that last line. <laughs> we, we planned it in a way where like he gets one, I get another. He gets one, I get another. So we we did our best to make it fair, and I ended up with the last line. Now to get the feedback from that performance as well. I mean, Kelly was going on the entire performance about the tone, and is has that been maybe one of the biggest uh, feedbacks that you've received from from listeners and fans as well? Yes, um, Kelly is, Kelly's amazing. Um, And I fell in love with her from the show. I'm like, oh my gosh, I love Kelly Clarkson. I always knew her before, but after hearing everything she said to me and like just bringing so much insight and inspiration and making me feel like I'm good enough, you know, like I can pursue something great, um, just changed my life. And I, I have to thank her for that one day. Now, how has your musical inspiration, has it evolved since being on The Voice? Uh, have you been pulling from maybe some different genres that you, you never really saw the interest in before? Yes, yes, for sure. Um, I'm, I would consider myself a pop artist, but pop not in the, not in the, on, the sense of only like quick, fast songs, um, quick beats, in a sense of like Ed Sheeran is also pop mm-hmm. and Taylor Swift is also pop. So there are all these love songs that still fall in that category. Um, but it's also opened my eyes to R&B, like all, all other genres, which I started with some bossa nova when I started the show. Um, and I like to be diverse. So it's opened my eyes to being open to so many different genres. And even like one of the battle rounds was uh, in Ariana's team, which was no matter what I do, all I think, <laughs> like some old school stuff. And I'm like, oh, my God, this looks so dope. Like, I, I got to look into this stuff. So, yes, um, it has brought a new range to my mind in music. Now, now, where did the first inspiration for music and, and, and where did that tone for you? Where did you start perfecting that? When did you know that you had something special with music? I started actually leading worship in church. Um, and so that's where I got most of my training in my early teenage years. Um, and I would listen to like just worship music and lead it on Sundays and Fridays. And that's where I feel like I got used to the big crowd. (laughs) It was like 500 (laughs) people, big crowd, um, diverse culture, Spanish, American, Brazilian, because it's a, a, a big church. Um, and that's where I was able to experience my voice and kind of perfect my tone, which I still have to do so much more. Especially now, it's like a bigger audience. It's nationwide, <laughs> so it it changes everything. Yeah. Now, how much has your have you had to rely on your faith? I mean, I know that, that you guys have been kind of sequestered, unlike uh, maybe even more so than they have been before. How much has your your faith helped you in those uh, those questioning times, if you will? Um, I believe that. Um, there, I, what I always tell my students, I'm a music teacher, and I tell them there's no difference between you and Justin Bieber, between you and John Legend and Ariana Grande and Kelly Clarkson. The only difference is they were in your shoes one day and they said, I want to do something. I want to become an artist. I want to make it big. I want to whatever their dream was. And I, that's what I tell them. And I say, um, one day they were in sixth grade. One day they were a student just like you. So there is no difference. It's not like they were a different species. You get me? Mm-hmm. Um, and, and that kind of makes them think like, you're right. Like 
if I want to do something, then you go hard for it and you work hard and you fight for it and you push. And that's what I do for myself because I, I teach what I live. And, and I find that that's what helps me the most is chasing your dreams and believing you have to believe this is going to happen for me. That's good stuff. And uh, now I want to make sure and let our listeners know if uh, to keep up social media wise and as the voting continues on as well, I'm, I'm sure you're going to be given some little clues on how folks can vote for you as well, right? Um, yes. My Instagram is Sabrina Diaz Music. Diaz with an S, D-I-A-S. Um, Sabrina Diaz Music. My Twitter is Sabrina Diaz. I mean, my in- my TikTok is Sabrina Diaz Music and my Twitter is Sabrina Diaz Musy, no C, because uh, I don't know. They didn't let me put the C. <laughs> <laughs> Too many characters, right? Yeah, that's it. <laughs> <laughs> well, again, Sabrina, it has been great to visit with you today. Uh, appreciate you taking some time out of your schedule. Continued success, and hopefully we'll catch up again real soon. All right. Thank you so much. It was a pleasure meeting you. Now, more families are getting together for Thanksgiving and Christmas this year, so this is the exact product that we'll need more of, not less. A major alcohol shortage might be coming just in time for the holidays. Stores in Southern California are already dealing with it because of pandemic-related backlogs at the Port of Los Angeles and the Port of Long Beach. Now, they're the two busiest container ports in the U.S., 40% of all shipping containers pass through there. Now that's led to shortages of all kinds of things, including alcohol and glass bottles. The regional manager for a chain of liquor stores in LA says they have no idea which products they'll be getting each day. One day this weekend, around 50 people were already lined up when they opened just to be the first to get their hands on whatever alcohol they got in that day. They're not totally sold out of alcohol, but he said certain types of booze are flying off the shelves, and as soon as they stock more, it's gone in a day. A shortage of supply chain workers also isn't helping. December 18th is the deadline for companies that work with the federal government to get employees vaccinated or lay them off. So if the government and vaccine-hesitant workers refuse to budge, that could lead to even more supply chain issues. From Team Kelly. She is from Kentucky. We've got Holly Forbes on with us. And first off, Holly, a privilege to visit with you. Yeah, it's so nice to be here. Nice to meet you. And it's exciting. I, I tell you, it can't be much more exciting than what has been going on this season. You made it through the the battle rounds and Holly, each round that you make it through, I mean, what is what's the feeling of exhilaration when you know that you're still in the competition, if you will? Oh, it's exciting and just like, I, it's unbelievable in a way. Like I haven't expected to make it like past any round, like in my mind. So every, every time I make it through, it's just, I'm so thankful and like shocked, I guess. <laughs> now, now Holly, what we, we love to ask and find where the music came from in your life. When did you know that music had a special place in your life? Um, I think I was around seven. I was singing and you know my family was just like wow you you have a good voice you should you know start singing so I started singing with my dad and my sister in a gospel group and um, really came up in church singing for most of my early life Um, and yeah I guess that's really when I when I started having love and then you know more as an adult like probably my early 20s I started taking it more seriously and um i just felt like music was the only thing that really made sense for me um so yeah now who was, doing it a long time who was the driving force but be, be, between behind you going and and trying out for the voice in the first place and, and what was that blind audition experience like oh man i think that probably my family you know my kids and my fiance. Um, they've really been like the force behind me and feeling like I had, you know, something to do it for other than myself. (laughs) It's hard when you're a mom to like do things for yourself, I guess. But um, yeah, I think they're, they're my main reasons. And the blind audition process was crazy. Um, A little scary, you know, not knowing (laughs) like day to day what's going to happen, but um, ultimately the best decision ever. 
So I'm, yeah, I'm just really thankful that I had the opportunity and that um, having my family back home, even my extended family to take care of things, you know, without me being there and help out. It's been, um, it's been like a team effort really. And the, going into the battle rounds, obviously it, it's still a competition, but a lot of the battles, it seems like they're more of a duo than, than a competition. And how hard is that to, to, to keep your mind on the song while still being a competition uh, against one of your <laughs> friends as well? Um, you know, for us, I think that we're all in agreement. Like the goal in the battles for us was just to give such like a good performance that hopefully both of us would get to stay, you know, like um, just to give a beautiful performance, hoping that the person who didn't make it um, would get like stolen or saved or something. Uh, so that's kind of how we go into it. And, you know, being like with these people so much, you really develop like close friendships. So I don't know. I mean, it is a competition, but I think for all, pretty much all of us, we just saw it as a chance to give like a gorgeous performance and, from there, hopefully, you know, we would both get to stay or just being really thankful for um, each other and proud for whoever moved on. And, and Holly, with all of the pandemic protocols that, that everybody's having to to be mindful of, has that helped you kind of stay in the moment or to focus in on the maybe the coaching, some of the little tidbits that you've received? Has that helped a little bit on that side of things? Yeah, I would say, you know, you're not like you can't go out and you know, do crazy stuff. <laughs> you really have to stay like, keep mindful and make sure you're staying healthy and you're not exposing yourself. So I think it's really helped to, you know, focus your mind and um, not be going a million places or whatever in LA, just kind of being present and practicing and everything. Now, what's the biggest thing that you've learned about yourself through this in, in this period, especially kind of be, having to do it on your own? Uh, you, you obviously talking to family and all that uh, as you have time, but doing this on your own, what's the biggest thing you learned about yourself? Um, well, mainly that um, I need coffee to function. <laughs> I'm just being on my own every day. I'm like, oh, this is something I really need. Uh, and also just I guess just being like more confident in myself because, you know, I'm used to playing with other people or like being in a band or a duo. So just being like solo has been, it's been eye opening for me to, to be able to support, you know, myself and um, just singing solo. is just like super cool, <laughs> I guess. But um, just knowing that I can do it, you know, as a solo artist is, is pretty cool. That's awesome. Of course, uh, the season continues on and the voice uh, on NBC. Holly, I always want to make sure and let our listeners know where they can keep up with everything you got going social media wise. So that is a way as uh, as time comes to vote, they know where to do that as well. Holly, where's where's the best place that our listeners can keep up? Um, well, if they're wanting to vote, I would definitely say download the voice app. That's super, super important. You can vote there. Um, if you want to follow me, I have Twitter, um, Instagram, Facebook, everything um, under Holly Forbes Music. So just all one word, Holly Forbes Music. You can find me pretty much anywhere. TikTok, all those places. All right. Well, again, from Team Kelly, Holly Forbes from this season of The Voice. Continued success to you. And uh, hopefully we can catch up again real soon. Yeah, I'd love to. It was nice to meet you. Well, break out your Oakleys and go get those tips frosted because 90s everything is trendy again. Google Trends just put out a bunch of stats showing that the 90s have officially overtaken the 80s as the decade we're most nostalgic about right now. They look at how many people have been Googling different decades over the past year from the 1960s through the 2000s and the 90s are number one. Searches for 90s stuff represent 31% of all decade-related searches, the 80s are next at 29%, then the 70s with 19%, the 60s with just under 12%, and the 2000s with less than 10%. Now, Searches for the phrase 90s outfit hit an all-time high this month, so did searches for four 90s items, crop tops, sweater vest, 
platform shoes, and anything preppy. 90s jeans are also getting trendy again. Searches for wide leg jeans, mom jeans, and low rise jeans are all up. Searches for 90s hip hop songs are also up 400% in the past month, and a ton of people are searching for 90s Halloween costumes this year. As season 21 of The Voice continues on NBC, and uh, from Team Kelly, we've got uh, Haley Mia on the line with us today. And Haley, the battle rounds, uh, what can you say about that experience? Um, it was a very, very amazing experience. I feel so honored that my first ever duet was with Raquel. She was very welcoming, such open arms, and she just made me feel so comfortable. Um, it was since it was my first duet at first, I really didn't even know what I was doing. Like I had no idea how to harmonize, but you know, they really all helped me like navigate myself through the experience and just being on stage with her and feeling the crowd and feeling her energy just made me feel so good and like accomplished. And I just, I'm so grateful. Now, Haley, are you the youngest contestant this year? Yes, yes, I am. What kind of pressure does that put on you, or or do you feel maybe a, a little more free because of uh, because of the youth, if you will? Um, I it is a lot of pressure, but you know, I just kind of also feel like it's also really it's really cool having, you know, all of these older people tell you about their experience with, you know, music and like their life. And I just feel like that's super inspirational, but it's it's pressuring but it's not at the same time it's kind of just like okay i'm here i know what i have to do and that's really how i felt now Haley, you talked about the pressure of singing a, a duet for the first time what was it like singing to chairs with their backs to you for the I, i'm pretty sure that's probably was a first for you as well right Yes, yes, definitely. It's at first it's super intimidating, but you know, as, when you get on that stage and I guess you're in your groove and you're in in your head and you know, just like singing your heart out doing what you all ever know and it's just like you feel free kind of when you ha when you're so passionate for something, you just kind of feel like okay, like this is this is what I want to do. Like this is this is something that I've always wanted to do. And I just have to, you know, be in the moment and just really grab it and reach for it if I really want it. And whenever you finally saw the chairs turn, what was, how hard was it to con continue singing at that point? I it's okay. This is so funny because I sing with my eyes closed and like <laughs> for like, the entire performance, like my eyes were closed because I was getting into it, like in my zone. And like at the very end, when I saw Ariana turn and then I saw Kelly, I internally, I was screaming. I knew I couldn't scream out loud, <laughs> but I was, I was in complete and utter shock, but I, I'm so grateful in my head. I was like, this is not real. <laughs> Now, when you make the choice for for to take on a coach as as your own coach, what was the what was the overwhelming reason to to, to go for Coach Kelly? Um, I guess in my mind, you just kind of have to feel the vibe between each person as you're speaking with them in those little moments when you're on stage, and for my opinion in my head, I just kind of felt like at that place moment in time that I, you know, had the the best vibe with her and I just wanted to have her as my coach. So I picked her. Now, what's been the best piece of uh, the best tidbit of information you've received from Kelly this year so far? Um, Probably to just not overthink everything so much and just you know, sing and just not overthink it and just be in my zone and to just let it all out, really. Now that now that the battle rounds for, for you have passed, how much relief was there uh, now now that you're continuing on? And, and what's the, the, the big thing you've been really working on uh, as of late since the battle rounds? Um, I have been working on a lot of things, actually. I am just, you know, still doing vocal lessons, working on my voice, working with everything and just kind of, you know, doing my thing in my groove, I guess. 
That's awesome. Now, Haley, of course, uh, if folks want to be able to vote for you as the season continues on, obviously you want them to follow you social media wise so you can keep them up to date how to vote. Uh, and Haley, where's the best place for the listeners to uh, to keep up with you social media wise? Um, on my TikTok, it's official Haley Mia. And my Instagram is also official Haley Mia as well. Right now, at the moment, I do not have Snap or Twitter, but those are the best two places to catch up with me in my life. All right. Well, again, from Team Kelly, Haley, Mia, it has been great to visit with you. Continued success this season, and uh, hopefully we'll talk again real soon. Thank you so much. It was an honor speaking with you. Now, if someone could just invent a robot vacuum that answers your door and makes phone calls, it'll be the hottest Christmas present for sure. A new survey looked at the top gadgets that Americans would love to get this year, and here's what got the most votes. Number one, a new phone that's 5G. It's also the number one thing people want globally this year. Number two, video doorbell. Number three, robot vacuum. Number four, wireless headphones. Number five, smart exercise equipment like a Peloton bike. Number six, a PlayStation 5. Number seven, wearable fitness trackers like Fitbits and Apple Watches. Number eight, smart speakers. And number nine, an Xbox Series X. From Team Blake, we've got 17-year-old Carson Peters. He's not the youngest at 17. Carson, <laughs> thanks so much for taking the time to visit with us, brother. Well, no problem, man. Thanks for having me. Now tell us, uh, I read the bio, heard the story before, but how did music come so early to you in your life? And obviously at 17 years young, you have a lot of musical ability and uh, and time behind you that you've been performing. Uh, yeah, man. It. I think a lot, a lot of it had to do with where I was born. I was born, you know, in Eastern Tennessee, has a lot of music roots, uh, birthplace of country music museum is 15 minutes from my house. So, uh, you know, it's just um, a really good area for, for bluegrass and country music. And uh, my, my father played guitar. He started when he was eight and um, quit. Uh, and we went off to college and then started back up when I got started. Um, when I was, mom and dad always say I was just really musical as a little kid. You know, I'd tap my foot to music at church and they'd say it'd be in time and I could tell you what key a song was in or something. Uh, and then they, they got me a, a ukulele when I was like two and a half. And uh, I started picking out songs on that at, at three. And they, they figured they should put an instrument in my hands. So I, they, they got a, a fiddle at a, we were on vacation in Pennsylvania and we were uh, just stopping by a little Amish flea market and we saw a fiddle. It was like a one eighth size fiddle. So uh, it fit me pretty good. And uh, so they bought <laughs> that and, uh, you know, just a, a lot of hard work after that hard work and practice. And uh, we got where we are now, but. Now, Definitely uh, my family and, and the area have influenced uh, my music for sure. Now, you've had some big opportunities to to play in front of some huge crowds. And, and how much has that helped you so far, you think, this season? Uh, you know, it definitely helped with the nerves. Uh I mean, I'm not going to say at all that I, that I wasn't nervous because that was definitely <laughs> the most nerve wracking thing I've done in my career by far. Uh, but, you know, just just knowing that I have been on a big stage before and everything went well, uh, nobody died, uh, helped a lot. <laughs> um, so uh, just um, just having those little things to tell yourself backstage, you know, OK, you've done this before, not, not have been exactly this, but you've done something like it a big pressure situation and you've came away just fine. Uh, so I mean, just definitely having those little things to tell yourself. And uh, uh, I think that prepared me really well for this. Now, what has been the biggest, uh, the, the biggest piece of tidbit information that, uh, that Blake has helped you with so far this season, or, or maybe was he just pulling out inner uh, confidence, if you will? You know, in my opinion, there is not a better song picker in history than Blake Shelton. Uh, he does a great job of just, you know, finding songs that will bring out an edge in somebody's voice that you didn't hear. You know, I don't know how he does it, but he does. And uh, he uh, he picked great songs for my battle and, and knockout. And, um, well, we, we picked uh, our songs for the knockout, but for our battle, uh, he picked, you know, the best the best song he could have for, for me and Clint. You know, it brought out different tones in both of us and uh, just little things he said. Uh, Blake's not the guy that will flat out tell you uh, in some 
theological way how uh <laughs> how it's how how you need to sound better he uh he gives you little tidbits of information it's like he just spews them out and he's got so much information that he can't just put it all together uh so he'll spew spew one out and he told me and clint you know stop trying to sound like vince gill you're not vince gill there's a reason <laughs> vince gill is vince gill and uh you know that that really applied to me for other things you know when uh it's like if you're singing a song uh recorded by you know a british artist and uh you catch yourself with a british accent that you didn't have before um, you know, I, I used to I used to kind of almost emulate anybody I was singing when I would sing their song subconsciously. So now that I think about it, uh, it really has helped me find my own voice and not not so much uh, being an impression artist. And as you find your own voice, being a musician myself as well, finding your own voice is probably one of the hardest things because you're always trying to sound like what people are used to hearing on the radio. Right. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, they're. Uh, it's, it's really hard to, um, a lot of voices are taken, you know, <laughs> so uh, finding, your, finding your own uh, is definitely a, a, a challenge. It's not, not as much your own tone or anything like that, because that's obviously a more unique thing, but it's, you know, you're the way you look at a melody, you know, if you're going to write some music, the way you, the way you structure the music, what words you write, you know, your voice is a lot more complex than, than when you first just say the word, your voice. So, I mean, definitely trying to find that for me was a, was a, a, a challenge, but um, I think I'm, I'm, I'm trending in the right direction. <laughs> That's good. Now, uh, Carson, if folks want to, uh, to keep up with everything you've got going on the social media side, obviously to be able to keep up and vote for you as the time becomes, uh, becomes right as well. Carson, where's the best place for folks to keep up with you? Um, me personally, I, I am most active on on instagram and that'll be uh peters carson underscore um but uh my, our band uh carson peters and iron mountain it's a bluegrass band we have our facebook page and uh and also have an individual facebook page but uh a lot of our bluegrass scheduled stuff is going to be on uh, on the the facebook page it has a direct link to our website and uh my uh country solo page will uh, will have some information on it as well as to where i'm going to be and stuff and Always vote for me on the voice app. That's that's about <laughs> all it is. But. That's right. Now, uh, Carson, I do have to say, uh, as I was delving back into it, I, I pulled up the Carson Peters in Iron Mountain. Been a fan of Iron Mountain. Love the work that you guys are doing together as well. Thank you, man. Yeah, we, uh, we've been a band for about seven years now. Um, uh, we've got three guys. We got one that's uh, 19 and one that's 22 um now and then me at 17 so we've all grown up together um we started a youth band at a little uh bluegrass music competition mm. and we we won the the band competition for three or four years in a row and figured we ought to take this somewhere else other than just the competition so uh we uh, we we organized a little band it's got my my dad's playing guitar and uh one of our one of the other kids dad is playing playing the, the banjo so it's uh really really cool to uh, have a two pairs of father and son uh duos out there so uh it's cool we ha we have a really good time doing it that's awesome well carson great to visit with you this morning sir i wish you continued success and hopefully we'll catch up again real soon brother well thank you man thanks for having me i had a great time Now, I've heard a lot of people getting angry at their job and, you know, wanting to burn the place down, but this is somehow even more hellish. A 61-year-old man in Ireland has just been sentenced to six months in prison for releasing rats in his office. He worked for the county government and he'd been there for 23 years, but then had a falling out with his manager. He brought the rats into the office and set them free at night, and when everyone arrived in the morning, there was rat poo everywhere. Now, the guy was ratted out by security footage, which showed him bringing them in. Now, the rats caused almost $3,500 in damage. In addition to the six-month prison sentence, the man had to cover the $3,500 cleaning bill. The judge said it was a, quote, uniquely wicked act, because of all the effort he put into finding, catching, and releasing the rats. Season 2 just released uh, this last weekend of Lock and Key on Netflix. We've got Darby Stanchfield with us today. And uh, first off, Darby, great to visit with you. 
Hi, Cameron. Thanks. Thanks for having me on. Now, the the season two lock and key, how excited are you for it to be out there? And, and what's it like getting those fan reactions from those that have been waiting, if you will? You know how Netflix does to us. Yeah. Oh, it's fabulous. I'm on Twitter and Instagram and, um, and have had a lot of uh, messages that way and a lot of emails from people I know and, and you know, text messages, friends and family. And it's... Um, the reaction is great. We just released season two. It's like dialed up to 11 from season one. Season one really sets up the premise of the show, and it's 10 episodes long, and you get right into, you know, the drama, and there's a big cliffhanger. Hanger. And then season two <laughs> um, launches, and it's just uh, nonstop action. And uh, and it's so it's really fun because... Um, the reactions have been great. It's it's trending all over the world right now, and it's um, it's um, doing really well already. So it's 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 so fun to you know have worked on something really hard this last year during the pandemic, and then and then see the see the reactions of the fans and how much they're enjoying it. And Darby, how much different is the reaction from viewers on on a show that streams on Netflix as opposed to some of the other series that you've been on before? I mean, what is there yeah, a, is there like a big a difference? Show. Well, it's just a wider scope. You know, uh, having come from a network show, uh, you know, I was on a show for ABC for seven years, and that was really more. You know, it's really just uh, the U.S. mostly mm-hmm. until that hits a streaming platform. But Lock and Key is airing all over the world. So I'll get messages from Japan or, you know, a bunch of different countries in South America, um, Europe. I mean, it's just incredible, the global reach and how many people really are watching it all over the world. So it's just a massive audience. And that's kind of exciting. It's I, I really enjoy getting different points of view from, you know, different countries and and. And the audiences there and, like, what they connect to, it specifically maybe in that country, like what storyline touches them. Lock and Key is a show that has a little bit of everything. It's sort of a family drama, uh, a, mystery, a murder mystery about it within this family about this mysterious murder of their dad. And then it's, um, you know, it's, it's a magic, sh- it's a show with a lot of magic and adventure, too. I would almost describe it like, a ster- uh, like Stranger Things Me Terry Potter. It's in that world. So it really does sort of, um, you know, hit different audience members. Some people really like the family stuff, and other people are just really into the magical keys of Lock and Key and the big, the big house, key house, where all these keys live in. And, um, you know, everybody has different favorite characters. So, uh, yeah, I really enjoy the interactions with the global audience and darby how close is uh, <laughs> do, you, do you find yourself to the, the the character that you play on the show and whenever you finish shooting on on a series like this does it take you a little bit yeah. to get back to becoming just darby again if you will okay so i play nina Locke, who is the mom on the show she's the matriarch of the family and she has three kids and her her husband was was murdered and she's now in this, she's moved them cross country from Seattle to Matheson, Massachusetts, and she's doing it all on her own. She's, you know, she's raising a family, she, she has a job, and she's, you know, trying to get over this tragic murder of her husband. So I'm not a mom in real life, so that's all very new to me. I mean, I have, you know, friends who have kids, and of course I have a mother, so I understand the the mother relationship, but it's, it's a new, it's definitely not something that I, that I naturally am. So I, so that's new. Um, sure. There are parts where, where we connect. Um, but you know, for the most part, this world, this magic world, she's also a recovering alcoholic. It's, it's a recurring theme within the first two seasons of lock and key is uh, this, you know, uh, trying to stay sober and when things get rough, um, that's also something that is not, that's not an issue in my life. That's not something that I deal with. So it's a very, it's a very different character than myself. Um, And I think, you know, there's always a certain sort of 
I wouldn't say that I'm method, so it's not a crazy unplugging, but there is a sort of sort and a certain, you know, nice to take some time off after after playing a character and just go on vacation and and really spend time with my own family and friends when I'm done. Um but um, it, it, it's, it was such an enjoyable ride shooting it. Um, we also shot season three back to back with season two. So I was in Canada for a year shooting this away from my family during the pandemic. So this particular instance, um, it was really nice to just take a little bit of a pause after. It was just a long time to be away from home. That's right. And again, uh, season two of Lock and Key is available now on Netflix. And Darby, I always want to make sure and let our listeners know where they can keep up with everything you've got going on, new projects as well as maybe social media wise. Yes, I am on Twitter and Instagram. It's Darby S. Official on both. Uh, I have the handle on both, both Twitter and Instagram. So that's where you can message me and tell me how you like Lock and Key. There you go. Well, again, check out uh, Season 2 of Lock and Key. And Darby, it has been great to visit with you today. I uh, wish you continued success, and hopefully we'll catch up again real soon. (laughs) Thanks so much. You too. Have a great day. Well, thanks again for joining us for this 140th episode in Season 2 of Good Questions with Cameron Dole. If you ever have a comment, a question, anything else you'd like to know, you can hit me up on the contact page at gqwithcam.com. You can also find me on Instagram, Twitter, TikTok, and Facebook at GQ with Cam. If you'd like to help out in the funding for this podcast, visit our merch store where we've got hoodies, shirts, stickers, tumblers, mugs, and much more. That's gqwithcam.com forward slash shop. And if you have a special guest idea, just email me, gqwithcam at gmail.com. Would like to say thanks to our good friend Brandon Allen for coming up with our theme music once again. We're going to let him play us out and hope you guys have a great rest of your evening.